Our SI position paper calls to raise awareness and action for climate change. No woman or girl is immune to the reach of the effects of climate change, no matter how subtle or dramatic the environmental shift may be. Training programs and capacity building that target women and support their role in implementing climate mitigation and adaption policy give women and girls an awareness of what climate change is and how to adapt one's life to a changing environment which in turn gives women and girls power to recognise and choose options that improve their situation. Sir Optimist International supports the implementation of the 2030 Agenda through its federations, unions, regions and clubs. By working on the ground with partner organisations and UN agencies to educate, empower and enable women and girls everywhere. Sir Optimist International and Women for Water Partnership have created and implemented projects for women around the globe. Women are vital in achieving equitable access to water for all, linking SDGs five and six. Women and water are deeply connected. As, 20, as the 22nd of March, 2022 is World Water Day, Focusing on groundwater, making the invisible visible. Sir Optimist International, together with Women for Water Partnership, bring you this presentation, Women, Water and Climate Change, Roles and Risks, Tackling the Challenges. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Ula, Ula Madsen, that is now going to moderate this session. Thank you very much, Ula. Thank you so much, Lee. I don't know if you presented yourself, but uh, Lee is our director of advocacy. So thank you, Lee, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and happy World uh, Water Day, as I said before. I think it's very important, and thank you for the very nice introduction, Lee. It is a pleasure for me to be the moderator of this important event, event with such amazing panelists. A warm welcome to Marit Mahouf Cohen, Barbara Pozzo, Helen Barry, Linda Vuitton, Maramuri, and Rose Mavangi. Helen Barry will not be able to join us today, but she has pre recorded a video. Rose Mavanga uh, has taken over from Asha Abud Rahman. Very much, Rose. I hope she is here now. Uh, for stepping in at the last minute. I will introduce each of the panelists before they uh, take the floor. To save time, you will find their bios in the chat. So thank you, Lee, for helping me with this task. A few house rows before we start. Please mute your mic uh, when not speaking. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will have a question and answer um, section after the speeches. Questions for Helen Barry will be answered by her after the webinar. And dear panelists, when you hear this tone, you will have one minute to wrap up. So I just want to know if Marit is here. Is she here? Really? Yes, she is. Oh, very good. Hi, yes, I am. Okay, Just, uh, perfect, Marie. In last <laughs> second, but you, you did it. So um, yes, I will, yes. <laughs> thank you, um, Marie. I will welcome you as the first speaker. Uh, Marie Rahouf Cohen, President of Women for Water Partnership and past president of Softimist International. And I told before that you were talking from Dakar, Senegal, attending the ninth World Water Forum. Marit will talk about the catalytic, uh, catalytic role of women in water management. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ula. And uh, you're going to do my presentation, which is very nice. Thank you. I am convinced that we are all aware that the world faces a severe and immediate triple crisis in water, which is making the achievement of SDG 5, including SDG 6, more and more challenging. 
Next page. Uh, the three crises are the global COVID-19 pandemic, the pursuit of economic recovery and growth, and then, of course, the devastating impacts of climate change. All three threaten to push the achievement of SDG 6 even further off track. And that is not even mentioning the water crisis, the, the war in the Ukraine and, of course, earlier in Syria is creating and was creating. We all should realize that water is the solution to a crisis and not the problem. We should really realize that on this International World Water Day. The battle to manage COVID-19 pandemic requires greater efforts on hygiene and sanitation and access to water is essential. The, fin the financial cost of the pandemic is a huge burden and econo economies need to recover after this. But water resources are needed for and by all sectors, and water is a huge multiplier on investment. The world is having to mitigate and adapt to climate change, and this is dependent on the long-term resilience and sustainable use of water resources. I mean, we had a discussion today that even I probably all sectors, industry, agriculture, uh, health, all sectors have to reduce their water use by 25% if at one stage they want to achieve SDG 6. So the next slide. And that is why Women for Water Partnership together with Aquafet, made a statement where we urge all stakeholders to act on water and react. Political will, partnership, people participation, involving women and girls, and to link SDG 5 and 6 are the drivers for action that will deliver the promises that have been made in 2015. Water, water's ultimate value is that water is life. And it is absolutely essential to all of us and to all sectors. Poverty reduction, food and nutrition security, human development, gender equality, women's empowerment, economic independence, climate action, environmental pr uh, protection, vocational training, biodiversity and ecosystem preservation, preservation, humanitarian action and peace and, sustain, and stability. These are all depending on water. Next one, please. There are five challenges that all stakeholders together must achieve to significantly move forward and achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And number one is the stronger political will. Water impacts all aspects of our existence and has many values to people. It must have its rightful place at the core of public policies, especially those on health, food, hygiene, environment and climate change. This requires action for everyone. And in countries where political will has been strong, there have been huge positive um, changes. The second one is governance. Weak governance has plagued the water sector for too long and has held back development of services and access to desperately needed finances. Wash, water and sanitation and hygiene, services and water resources must be managed with integrity, equity, transparency, and involving all people and stakeholders. Strong water governance in today's world makes the critical linkages between water and sanitation and planning for health, climate, the environment, food, 
and agriculture. Yes. Sorry, there's someone. Please um, mute anyway, yourself when you're not speaking. Rose will uh, talk about Mihoko and the project there, where all these things have been implemented. And then the number three is more finance. To close the enormous water financial gap, action is needed to mobilize finance from public to private, as well as international to domestic sources. What contribution to other sectors like health, environment, climate change must also be recognized in financial investments and planning. Existing funding has to be better directed to reach the most vulnerable populations. And women organizations and women projects should get direct finance. We all know that the OECD has done a research that all from all the ODAs, the women organizations and the uh, direct finance to women projects is 0.05%. I can tell you that's not a lot. Then the next one is people participation in decision-making. That is very important. It's not only the top that has to decide. Decision-making and outcomes are better when there is an active involvement and meaningful participation by people and users of water. The re this requires making data about services and resources timely. Sex disaggregated data Plus, it also needs to be understandable. It's fine to have sex disaggregated data if they are existing, but how do we get them to the uh, grassroots and to make them understandable? Because otherwise they can't implement them and everyone has to see them. So then my last point is five, which is a renewed commitment to multilateral action. Despite the many values and essential nature of water, there is no binding international policy on water management, apart from the Convention on Transboundary Water, which only has been signed by 30% of the people. So there is a void in the United Nations on this issue, since there is no intergovernmental body where states could exchange on the corrective actions that are necessary for water on a global scale. So it might be clear the next one uh, to you all that action is needed and action is absolutely vital. And Women for Water together with SI and its members keep highlighting the importance of these five top topics related to water, women and climate change. And I sincerely hope you will join us in our fight to achieve the combination of SGT4, five and six. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Marit. This is a topic you have been pursued for many years and always in a convincing way. Thank you for sharing your experience and expertise with us. And thank you for being punctual tonight. Even you have uh, challenges. <laughs> so um, I have the pleasure to welcome the next speaker. It is Professor Dr. Barbara Pozzo. The professor is a full professor of comparative law at the Faculty of Law and director of Department of Law, Economics and Cultures of the University of in Sumbria, Como, Italy. Barbara Pozzo will talk to us about the gender dimension of water and climate change. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, thank you for this presentation and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, now, I, um, I, I'm not able to share actually. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I found it, I found it. Perfect. Okay, so.
So um, I am a, a professor of comparative law, so I'm going to deal with this issue from this point uh, of view. And uh, as I have uh, not so many minutes, I'm not going through the whole index, but I will leave the slides. So if uh, you are interested, you can you can get through another time. I would like to begin with uh, with statement that. Uh, climate change, water management, agricultural activities, and from a legal point of view, land ownership are highly and strictly connected issues. So that is why I will go into depth also uh, into some recent reforms uh, uh, connected with uh, land property that gives you an example on how reforms in this field are going to tackle the whole issue. So let me begin with the very well known uh, uh, the parties that took place uh, uh, a few years ago, where uh, a decision on gender and climate change was taken to underscore the importance of coherence between gender responsive climate policies and the balanced participation of women and men in the convention's processes. So the significance of women's participation to climate policy and climate change mitigation and adaptation has uh, it has very has different faces has is multifaceted in the sense that on the one side women are often considered more vulnerable as a result of the adverse impacts of climate change especially in developing countries but on the other side they also play a crucial role as change agents as they guide the achievement of human development good governance sustain peace and harmony between environment and people, all of which are prerequisites for successful adaptation to climate change. So the impacts of climate change are most dramatically felt exactly through changes in water. Changes that will severely affect humans, societies, and the environment. And bear in mind that more than 90% of climate manifestations, for example, roads, floods, hurricanes, occur through water. And so one of the main keys for fulfilling the goals set out in the Paris Agreement will be wise water management. So the importance of involving everyone in the management of water was already recognized years ago. It's not just the last uh, phase of climate change uh, uh, conventions and so on, but we, go, we can go back to the 70s when the, uh, the United Nations Water Conference in 1977, and then in the International Conference on Water and Environment held in Dublin in 1992, uh, this statement was made very clear. In the Dublin statement, there are some important principles on water management that are connected with the role of women uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, issue. I just would like to recall two of the principles uh, that you find in this Dublin statement that if you are interested, I can send you uh, together with the PowerPoint. The principle number two uh, was underlying, as the previous speaker has already told, the importance of a participatory approach involving users, planners, and policy makers at all level in terms of water development and management. And uh, specifically, principle number two, I'm stressing how women can play a central part in the provision management and safeguarding of water. So uh, already the Dublin statement was recognizing the pivotal role of women as providers and users of water and guardians of the living environment that has seldom <clears throat> been reflected in institutional arrangements for the development and management of water resources. So acceptance and implementation of this principle requires positive policies to address women's specific needs and to equip and empower women to participate at all levels in water resources programs in ways defined by their own. So that is also very important. 
So as already mentioned in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, there are three dedicated goals, gender equality, clean water, climate action. And if we look to these three goals, we can immediately see that water management connects these three goals. Identifying in the interlinkages between these goals will facilitate more effective implementation of the goals and gender equality and gender responsive activities are also recognized, as I was saying before, in the Paris Agreement. So in this perspective, women are central to the collection and safeguarding of water and are therefore key to laying the foundations of a so-called resilient society and their role in decision-making uh, processes uh, is uh, nonetheless uh, very limited nowadays. Evidence-based research, it says, uh, indicates that water managers, on the contrary, gain efficiency and impact when both women and men are involved in decision making. Um, the, uh, just one second, that I cannot see so much. Oh. Okay. Uh, this, uh, uh, this situation that I have tried to describe until now finds some important legal obstacles. And I would like to focus our, your attention on this particular matter in sense that gender inequalities that reduce women's access to resources, such as, for example, limited ability to own land and acquire concessions for groundwater abstraction, disproportionately increase their burden of climate change induced consequences. And uh, of course, these uh, Consequences include decreased food security, shortage of and reduced access to water resources, and they impact their responsibility as primary caregivers, as well as the health of their families. But it also impacts agricultural production and the care of livestock and increases the overall amount of labor that is expended to collect, store, protect, and distribute water. So. Uh, I don't want to go too, in, too much in detail, but uh, the, uh, um, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations have underlined how women are the primary producers of food globally and make up the majority of agricultural workers. We have seen in recent years a process that is called feminization of agriculture. And uh, uh, this means that generally, I don't want to go too much in details, but generally speaking, men who are the first to receive an education usually work with lucrative crops or migrate as seasonal or permanent workers in industries, while women cultivate a family plot for household consumption, care for small livestock and process and or sell part of their production in local markets. In areas where men migrate to cities in search of work, which is often uh, happening in uh, less developed countries, the proportion of farms and families run by women is growing very rapidly. The so-called feminization of agriculture, however, often implies a feminization of poverty. And available data show that in many regions of the world, one in five firms is managed by women. But even if it is like that in practice, Often, the male is and remain officially the head of the family, and as the, as the head of the family, he's also the head of the agricultural fund, even if women have become responsible for the daily work and management of the fund. So what we see is a situation where, in many societies, tradition and existing laws prevent women from taking ownership of the land and without the land that serves as a guarantee, women are also cut off from access to credit and without this, they often cannot buy essential materials such as seeds, tools, fertilizer and so on. So land ownership is seen in many countries as a, a, a huge obstacle to a better management of land, water and indirectly this can impact on climate change. 
because if women are not able to access to proper proprietary title, this means that they will find also limits of access to credit lines. And uh, these also will be uh, synonymous of uh, having difficulties in making oneself heard because uh, we do not have the power to being heard. Uh, that, is, uh, that goes hand in hand with another situation, that is to say what happens in education. Generally, boys are advantaged over girls in receiving an education, and limits in education lead to difficulties in accessing adequate information, also on the possibilities made available by the institutions to improve the existing situation. So this is a vicious circle, if you want, uh, that uh, uh, goes hand in hand with old customs and traditions that are connected with land property. In fact, many Asian, but also some African states have changed their inheritance legislation over the past 50 years, also because the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank have pushed towards this solution. But even if the law in the books has changed, the law in action has not very often changed. So still today, most Asian jurisdictions uh, still don't allow women uh, to uh, become owner of real estate. And Pakistan and Bangladesh have the most glaring restrictions in this matter. But let me give you one example that for me, it's very, very crucial. Uh, in the case of India, when India became independent uh, after the constitution of 1950, there was a very important Indian Succession Act in 1956 six, uh, that introduced equality between men and women with the exception of uh, uh, agricultural fields where only men could own uh, uh, agricultural fields. Then after the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and many other international organizations pushed on the Indian government. There was a very important reform in 2005, the Indian Succession Act, that introduces formally total equality between men and women. But what is happening? What is test? I mean, we have witnesses, we have research on what is really happening in practice. In practice, women in rural areas give up their right because they want to be able to continue to have good social relations. They want to uh, be able to continue seeing their parents. And so they often accept the lump sum instead of the property, but they don't become the manager. So the, the owner and the managers of the land. I don't want to go too much uh, in details, but this is a situation that we find, uh, simi a similar situation that we find also in China, where uh, in, in, in the law, there is clearly written that women are equal to men, but in rural China, ancient traditions survive, and uh, uh, this is certainly to the detriment of women. In Nepal, there is a different approach. So they have introduced some reforms uh, on inheritance taxes that are lower if the property is registered in the name of a, of a woman. So there is a slight and this, I, this, this is something that I wanted to mention because I, I find is a happy, a, a, a happy uh, um, exception, the one of Bhutan, where traditional rules provide for matrilineal succession mm. and the land passes from mother to daughter. And uh, where we all know that there are also other different, uh, uh, in, how do you say, point of view concerning the style, the welfare of the situ of the nation. Bhutan, in fact, has introduced also at constitutional level the idea of gross, gross national happiness instead of gross national product. And the criteria taken into consideration are air quality, citizens' health, education, and the richness of social relationship. According to the classic approach, Bhutan yeah, is uh, one uh, of the- Porto, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would you please wrap up? Yes, I didn't hear your ring. Ah. So, because you generally, you, you said that you were going to ring- Yeah, that, that's true. 
so, uh, sorry, so I was going on and but anyways that this is that the last so the conclusions are that the reforms for women only that is to say simply allowing them to 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 get a piece of paper or a, a new rule as far as land ownership is concerned does not always uh, lead to the best results uh, so the major legislative reforms fail to displace the old traditions in the absence of a path of self-awareness and uh, uh, while inclusive reforms which lead men to reflect with women on concrete problems and how to deal with them have had more chances of success thank you very much thank you so much uh professor barbara Prozzo. that was really impressive um so many good points and um uh, I think there will be some questions. I'm sorry, maybe it was too long, but I was waiting. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but because um, you couldn't hear, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things you said about the ownership of land uh, and uh, yes. from women and um, yeah, and 80% and are working on the land. So it, it's yeah, exactly. really, yeah. Um, and also all the examples you gave and about the CEOs and the leadership of women uh, bringing better results that is the truth so we don't know why and uh, not more women are invited to be leaders at also at top level yeah. so thank you so much for now we will be back to you later so the next speaker is uh, dr helen barry she is an inaugural professor of climate change and mental health mental health at the university of sydney Helen Barry will talk about mental health connected with climate change. The questions asked in the video have been made by Dr. Georgia Behrens. Now we will listen to uh, the video prepared by Dr. Helen. I think the, uh, the first thing to say in relation to that question is that we actually don't know a great... Can you hear? Is it clear? The speech? Sorry, can any... Yeah, it's fine, it's fine, I can hear it's it. It's fine, okay, thank you. Still, there's a lot being, being written now about it, but there's not much really good evidence directly of the effects of climate change on mental health because they're both so difficult to measure and their relationship is difficult to measure. But we know lots about the effects of things like, for example, floods and storms and fires on mental health. And we know that climate change is irritating and aggravating all the precursors to bad weather of, of different kinds as we've got a very good example going on now. So, so we can assume a whole lot of things without necessarily having direct research findings around mental health and climate change. But I think the thing that I would I most like to stress about this is that climate change is a, a massive complex system in its own right. And the causes and consequences of health and mental health are also massive complex systems. So we have a situation here where two extremely large and complex systems are colliding and trying to make head or tail of that is really difficult. And maybe we don't need to worry too much about that because it's pretty obvious without doing research that this is a problem and it's upsetting people. And um, but I think it's important to understand what sits at the root of both of these things. And it is the same thing. And it's the exploitation of the planet and its peoples without regard for the cost to either. And that generates climate change, it generates harm to mental health, and it generates a huge number of other harms as well. Women are not equal in any country in the world, and they never have been, and there's not a lot of indication right now that we will be. And um, even in countries like Nordic countries, which do, which do really well compared to others, women are not equal. And so when there's inequality, then, then problems occur from both ends of attacking, if you like. And one is that those who, those who are disadvantaged, more disadvantaged than others, 
tend to have worse impacts of anything, whatever it is, whether it's climate change or transport problems or anything at all. It's always worse for those living with disadvantage and inequality. And then disadvantage and inequality are multipliers of whatever happens. That happens, women are trapped in that cycle all the time of being more likely to be hit harder by anything bad that goes wrong and, um, and less likely to get any benefits and profits and so on that are flowing around through a system, whatever they may be. And then when they are hit by what's going on, then it hits them much, much harder. Because as you can imagine, when people are living under constant pressure, they have fewer resources within themselves and in their lives um, with which to absorb the pressure. So, and that goes for all disadvantaged groups. So same for indigenous people, same for people living with disabilities, um, any, any disadvantaged group that you'd like to think of. And then disadvantage within the disadvantaged groups is much worse for women than it is for, for men. So, so women are stuck in a really difficult vortex and the answer to that isn't about health services and domestic violence programs and all this sort of thing, even though those are really important. The answer is the political. Pregnant women who experience any weather related stress have more difficult births and children have more difficult early development bonding looks like it may be less less good in those cases and so on so climate change is ramping up that pressure even before a baby is born and then when you look at babyhood a whole lot of things need to happen for healthy physical and psychological development in babies and toddlers that are highly dependent on what's going on in their their mum's lives often and their caregivers lives most of whom are also women so if women are increasingly affected by climate change, then what they can do in that, that nurturing role early on is compromise. And there are very practical things that kids can miss out on, like a good diet and plenty of exercise and so on, really simple things from that to really complex things like the, the kinds of teaching that, that little kids really need, like around language and sound and being read to and all that sort of thing. So that can all, all be jeopardised. And then when kids go to school, they start primary school, they have to go through a process of socialisation, which if they haven't had these early beginnings can be much more difficult. And that of course affects their learning. By the time they're in high school, you're, you know, you've multiplied this 50 times. And by the time they get to adolescence, they have a very great and greatly heightened level of um, sensitivity and vulnerability. So, so by the time young people are being spat out into the world and told to go ahead and be a grown up, they've missed so much that they needed. And climate change plays into every phase of their their development and their material well being, their intellectual well being, and so on. On the ground, there are millions and millions of individual things we can do, projects we can take on, ways we can support and help each other. But if we don't fight the political battle, then women's circumstances and therefore women's mental health will not improve. And we won't deal with climate change, which is hitting and will hit women um, harder than any other, any other groups. Thank you so much to Dr. Helen Barry and for the questions uh, Georgia Barron's um, came up with. <clears throat> Sorry, it is really a, a big issue about the mental, mental health. And I think if you have questions, please put them in, in the chat. Or oh, we can also, for just a minute, uh, have some uh, conversation about it. Uh, is there some comments, comments from one of you or two of you? It will be welcomed. Maybe for some of the speakers. Uh, what about you, Barbara? Do you have a comment to this? Well, the, how do you say, the mind of uh, uh, 
the lawyer immediately goes uh, to the issue how to quantify mental health problems <laughs> in terms of damages uh, because this will be very 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 difficult although, although there is a, a, a you know a development uh, taking into account uh, uh, mental issues problem uh, uh, in uh, processes and in the quantification of damages i think that this will be a very very difficult issue to to tackle yeah nevertheless uh, we we feel that it is exploring more and more yeah 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 in fact but it will yeah, be a new I know. a new challenge <laughs> yes it is a new challenge but i think it's important to speak about it Sure. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Barbara, <clears throat> for this intervention. So uh, the next speaker I would like to welcome is uh, Linda Vuitton. Linda is California Assistant District Attorney, Subtimist International Advocacy Advisor. Lin uh, Linda will give us a brief story of women, water, and the UN Assembly. Dear Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's great to see all of the familiar faces and to have a chance to speak. Um, and it's been great that the speakers have covered many <laughs> issues for me. Um, I wanted to talk about water scarcity and land and how they went together and what efforts were made as early as 1949. In 1949, a woman who were described as being trustees of the then present water scarcity and pollution and need to conserve water in the world, they knew the challenge. And there was one really interesting quote, um, which said, Someone said that water is more precious than gold and more explosive than dynamite because it gives life. It must be guarded, conserved, and beneficially used. And at times, it has been fought over with weapons, both legal or lethal. Where it's scarce, it must not be wasted or abused. Where it is rampant, it must be curbed. Where it is defiled, it must be cleansed. They predicted that in order for our world to survive, that not only would they need the experts that were present in 1949, but they would need to have hundreds of millions of people educated and become at a grassroots level uh, advocates for preserving water and along with it, the land. History shows that women and girls, however, faced uh, huge obstacles regarding both of those. And going back in time, it would take me thousands of pages to deal with what has happened with the UN. But what I could say at this point is that beginning with the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in 2000, the Human Rights Committee did say that the capacity of women to own property cannot be restricted on the basis of marital status or any discriminatory ground. As early as 1952, and this is what I found to be very interesting, they actually indicated that not only could women have the right to land, because at that point, as one of the professor pointed out, we were in the middle of a movement, if you will, to benefit small sized farmers, landless agriculture workers, as they constituted the majority of the rural population and underdeveloped areas. And with respect to that, we wanted to do, um, the UN said, we, we, we want women to have the right to own land. And not only did they say that, they said, we want them to have secure agricultural equipment. We want these type of farmers to have reduced high prices in the purchase of the equipment. We want them to have animals. We want them to have seeds. We want them to have fertilizers. Is this beginning to sound familiar? We want them to have agriculture implements and fertilizers at reasonable cost. God bless them. They were thinking even then. Then they also said, we want them to participate in technical assistance programs designed to increase food production and eliminate the causes of famines. We want to improve the collection of statistical information, huh? low interest agricultural credit and the establishment of agricultural credit systems should be meted out to them. We want them to have uh, enable agricultural workers, tenants, and small, medium-sized farmers to not have unduly high rents. We want them to be reduced or liquidate their indebtedness. We want unfavorable conditions of land tenure and serious rates of interest is gone. We want to adopt an appropriate wage, wage and improve the conditions of labor and for raising the living standards of agricultural workers. 
and we want to improve the collection of technical information. In 1957, they also said, we want to accelerate community development. So we want women to be encouraged to play an even greater part and a more effective part, both for their own interests and the communities. Since the 1950s, there have been at least eight committee of UN treaties and 20 international policy instruments, principles, guidelines, and recommendations, including Beijing and the 2030 agenda that have dealt with women's land rights, discrimination in land ownership, access to land, credit, and inheritance, and in cases of land disputes, forced eviction, as well as a lack of a rural woman's participation in decision-making process concerning land, and or, of course, the right and access to water. This does not include a steady parade of UN General Assembly resolu resolutions, oh, which have also focused on these is issues since the formation of the UN. And actually the UN resolution came out with a resolution in 1989 that said, hey, the United Nations is the one that makes the policy about climate and the environment. Therefore, if anybody poo poos the uh, resolutions, we can cheerfully give them the site. For that matter, I can give you the sites for everything I've said so far. How are we doing in 2022? Well, women who make up half of the global adult population, 43% of them are in the agricultural workforce, but they account for less than 15% of the farmland owners. 40% of the world's economy still limit women's property rights. 60% still have a male-centric cultural norm and legal inefficiencies that also hinder their rights. And for women who contribute to 50% of the food produced worldwide, they still represent 70% of the world's hunger. They still do not have access to public support programs, digital technologies, mobile phones, computers, or the internet. Only about over half, 95 of all economies mandate equal remuneration for men and women who perform work of equal value. And as late as 2017, there were still major reasons for gender credit gap, which had to do with uh, collateral constraints and social norms. The water is considered a human right, but even with the spread of COVID-19, the UN General Assembly resolution said, we are highlighting the lack of access to water and sanitation for women and girls. It still exists, especially appalling being as they were female health workers and caretakers for their family, that that would still be an issue. To make matters worse, the UN expressed deep concern that with the absence of international attention, future epidemics could surpass previous outbreaks in terms of intensity and gravity. Still very little improvement. The UN continue to encourage access to safe drinking water and adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all. It applies to natural disasters, humanitarian emergencies, internally displaced persons, refugees, and migrants. They are still trying to design, revise, and implement laws to ensure that rural women are accorded full and equal rights to own and lease land and other property, have equal rights to economic and productive resources, access to basic services, ownership, and control over land, and other forms of property, inheritance, natural resources, appropriate new technology, and banking and microfinancing. They are still trying to get women to have the same right to credit. They are still actually complaining about a limited access to quality education or training or sustainable time and labor saving infrastructure or technology. In short, what I would say is that we have still, despite the heroic efforts of the women that have spoken today and all of the advocates out there, we still have our work cut out for us. And in essence, it seems to me that we're met often with soaring rhetoric and bells and chimes in the background, but very little implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. It is such a unique research you have been doing. And it, it's um, marvelous, helpful when we are, <laughs> according to, to the um, agreed conclusion, and you work <laughs> on that with the CSW, and you can just pop up with say, well, in, in uh, 1952, they said so and so. And yeah. now they are saying so. You know, it's, it's really helpful and it's, it's a brilliant work. And I want everyone to look at it because it uh, you know we have talked about that before and you mentioned that you have sent it and we can find it but can we find it can something find it no i i i would actually uh say that 
my work, I have citations for everything I've said, and my work I would be gladly to share with any of you uh, so that you can aid in your arguments uh, down the line. So I'd be happy sure. to do Thank you so much, Linda. Sure. And CSW has it has it in their library too. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's brilliant. The next uh, speaker I would welcome is Mary Mura, Optimist International UN representative at the uh, UNEP in Nairobi. Mary will talk about youth resiliency and climate change, possibilities and barriers. Mary, please, you have the floor. We can Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Lila and everyone else. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Good evening, everyone from Nairobi, Kenya. I am very pleased to join the conversation in this CSW 66 uh, very uh, well um, articulated theme that is uh, quite uh, in our heart. And I want to uh, appreciate the previous speakers for speaking to most of the slides that I have but I want to take an opportunity to raise the voices of young people uh, in, the, in the importance in enabling and empowering them to contribute effectively to climate action and how important it is for them to integrate uh, agenda responsive approaches that will address the climate change. So I will have a youth, youthful voice uh, in my few minutes that I have with you. So what is youth resilience and climate change? Do we have possibilities or do we only have barriers? Or do we have both? I think we need to look into uh, both sides of the coins. And I will be glad to say that uh, the world all around us, I think is full of young people. And we are talking about more than uh, 1.3 billion young people that are aged 15 to 24. So when we talk about climate action, climate change, we cannot ignore the youth voice and their action and what it means to them to have a a, a, a good future or a climate that is uh, really uh, resilient for them in the future. What are some of the things that uh, interest uh, is going to be of interest to us? We know that uh, when it comes to problems that are posed by uh, climate change, young people are at the front line, especially young girls, adolescent uh, girls and young women, they will suffer most because of the problems that are posed by climate change. I will not belabor that because that has been already been outlined. They will face floods, they will have landslides and they will have earthquakes, they will miss school. And recently, because of COVID-19, they have missed part of their life. Uh, they have missed part of their life. And they say that they have not lived since 2020 because all through they were indoors and they never, everything stopped in their lives. They never went to school. They never uh, participated in any economic uh, em empowerment. And that has increased anxiety, hunger, and all that comes with uh, psychological trauma because of COVID-19. Uh, thanks to the previous speaker who spoke about mental health and what we can do to even address that. The youth phase, we know that it is quite a transition and that uh, young people at this particular age are quite independent. They want to be autonomous and they are really making choices that are really uh, profound. This will be about their career. It will be about uh, their consumption and even how to produce and be uh, 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 their, their, their issues and their practices in consumption of food. So whatever they do, it means a lot to our climate in the future. In the other sense, I think we also want to ask ourselves, is it, is it possible to have the agency on climate change to these young people? Are they able to respond to the agency that we want them to respond to? And what is their role? And how, the, how can they be very resilient and make our climate action uh, uh, responses to be quite uh, uh, unique? In this, it, there is a belief that uh, in them, that uh, many young people believe that uh, Climate uh, change is inevitable. However, they think it is so far away from where they are today and they, th that it's not connected to them. So how can we build an agency in them so that they can respond in the agency that we believe? Our policies, in the other hand, are really quite uh, also very uh, distant. And they talk about the 2030 agenda, 
the 2040 agenda. Here in Africa, we are talking about the 2063 agenda. And so the young people cannot really connect to that sort of agency to respond to climate change and the climate action agenda that we have at the moment. On the other hand, there is the psychosocial distance between climate change and their perception, and that uh, they are looking at uh, this catastrophic uh, global climate problems that happen today, that really it is like they will not happen in their lifetime. They will think that um, it doesn't feel like it is really near here. It is so, it's so far and it's not relevant to them. So we would really want to check and say, as young people, can climate action be relevant to them today? I want to look into the barriers and to the problems that really uh, make it difficult for young people to see themselves at the center of the climate change or the climate action solutions. They face various uh, problems and one of it is insufficient information. We do not focus into, in, into uh, letting young people to understand what is most relevant for them to do today. And so we want to look into their information sharing and also what we provide for them as skills in addressing climate change. In terms of access to land, I think the previous speaker has really explained this very well that uh, it is still a struggle and land ownership is a problem to women. It is actually a bigger problem for young people because they do not hold any land. The land that they live in belong to their parents and the caregivers that they, they live with. Over and above, they do not, young people do not have financial support and that they still feel very much inadequate when it comes to initiatives and, and, and working out to do climate action related initiatives because they lack uh, access to capital. The other barrier that we could look into is really the uh, long-term opportunities, uh, which is quite uh, minimal and that uh, the, global challenge, the global uncertainties make the young people not to consider themselves especially as farmers. They do not see agriculture as their first career choice. Actually, they look at agriculture as hard work and very laborious, very labor intensive, and it doesn't have immediate yields. They would rather not engage into agriculture or agribusiness because the yields are low, especially because of changed irregular weather patterns that bring very, very Meaning, 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 minimal rainfall patterns. So those are some of the barriers other than their perceptions and attitudes that uh, agribusinesses agri is actually not a value addition. It's not valued and socially accepted. They would rather have a white collar job. They would rather have a career where they can be able to be an engineer or uh, a school teacher or uh, an accountant as opposed to becoming a farmer. I want to say that uh, Amongst those uh, challenges that the young people already face and that uh, they feel that they are not in any position to do climate action related uh, initiatives, it is always not lost and that uh, we actually do have opportunities and possibilities that we can engage. And especially as sort of optimists uh, worldwide where we have access to adolescent girls and young women whom we can reach through our sort of optimist work in a very uh, uh, structured work way. One of the possibilities that uh, I, I want to highlight and that has worked is youth networks. Youth networks has become a quite uh, uh, a, a well embraced uh, opportunity to, in, to, 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 to engage young people and to actually have all of them share experiences because from one region to the other, they are able to see what has worked and what has not worked, and they're able to engage into socioeconomic approaches that are really uh, relevant to the particular uh, uh, location where they are coming from. So youth networks is one of the possibilities that we can embrace. Over and above uh, agribusiness being a socioeconomic empowerment, especially to young women, it is also a high retention rate uh, initiative that makes them to, to remain committed in their initiatives to climate action. Finally, the another uh, possibility is on advocacy and uh, giving young people the voices 
and the skills to be able to raise their 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 their, their, their desire to be heard, and especially on policy making and planning, whether they are living in the rural area or if they are in the urban areas, their voices are required so that they can be able to influence and they are able to input what will favor them as young men and women in the area of agroforestry act, uh, related activities. So this all in law will make their contribution towards climate change uh, a positive for us and in the future. I would want to look into the uh, uh, conclusion and just say that uh, properly uh, engaging young people is not easy because youth engagement in climate action in itself is a challenge because we know that uh, young people are not in one place. They are not in one phase. They are moving from being young adults to taking charge of their lives. And here is that we have got a challenge that is a global pandemic that we are calling a climate change pandemic that they have got to address today. Otherwise, if they don't address it, then their future is in jeopardy. So we have got to have multifaceted approach to segment and uh, have initiatives that address not just the men, young men, but also the young women and what is really relevant for them because both of them have different needs and have got different contribution towards climate action. There is need to explore increased incentives and especially uh, accessing uh, income and I mean uh, 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 accessing um, uh, accessing uh, capital for them to be able to engage in uh, agribusinesses because they have got to do initial uh, investments that the whether it is leasing the land or whether it is uh, coming together as a group to be able to undertake a, 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 a group a venture that will be able to finally give them in, uh, financial independence. It's really important that uh, we do have actions and, 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 and policies that really uh, make them access credit or access uh, capital for them to be able to do agribusinesses in the right manner. Finally, our approach to uh, youth uh, and climate action should uh, appreciate the diverse nature of our young people. And we, for us to make them resilient, we really have got to manage all the different uh, geographical related conditions and also uh, environments that uh, bring different opportunities and barriers in that uh, when I speak about young people in Africa, Africa alone has got different uh, landscapes. We have got the coastal region, we have youth in the highlands, we have got youth in the rural areas, and we also have youth in the cities and their different actions on the climate action will require uh, a, a, a focused and a, a very uh, targeted uh, approach to be able to meaningfully engage youth in climate action. Well, I would want to just say that uh, financial support to young people, especially in digital training, because uh, technology is here with the young people and they need to do smart farming. They need, need to uh, contribute in terms of what it, it takes to have applications that can make their produce get into the market at the right time so that they can be able to harvest what it really means uh, to participate in climate action. Fronting them as ambassadors of change in environmental uh, conservation and the diversity laws is, is really another way of really engaging young people over and above uh, the incentives that I have just talked about. This will make them to commit to their actions today for a better tomorrow that affects them as young people in climate action. Yeah, so uh, I want to say that reshaping our future is to act now and we have got to meaningfully engage our young people, especially in, in uh, agroforestry, in policy processes, and also in climate change mitigation. Thank you so much. I want to stop there for now. Thank you so much, Mary. And uh, thank you for taking focus on the youth because it is so important that we have them on board. And especially like uh, mentioning all the possibilities they have, 
So um, that was very impressive what you were doing. So thank you so much for that, Mary. Finally, I will welcome Rose Navangi, member of the Steering Committee Women for Water Partnership and also member of Optimist International. Rose is also talking to us, as I mentioned before, from the GAR, and she will tell us about the uh, Mahokyo Women Group Kenya Education and Training Program. So Rose, thank you for taking over for Asha at the last minute. The floor is yours. Hi, Thank Rose. You, very much. you can see you. You can see me, you can hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Ula. Um, in talking about Muihoko, I'd like to put a story across about these women. Um, these women lived in a village that was very, very dry. And 60% um, of their time was um, allocated to looking for water. A young man, one of their sons, brought a proposal and got funding to help the women buy water tanks and do other water-related um, techniques. It shows us that within the village, there is capacity for writing bankable proposals. This project was implemented, however, uh, cracks began to appear and um, the women were not getting the water tanks according to what was written in the proposal. The donor sought the help of Women uh, for Water Partnership, which requested Soroprimist International being on the ground to step in and intervene. That is the first area you look at in terms of governance. Um, here was a young man who had written the proposal. Money had come and already there was going to be a problem. So Roprimist International stepped in and the women finally got all their water tanks. These women were 26 women. And after uh, each woman, after each each woman was able to get water, a water tank, there was money that actually remained. And each woman was asked to recruit one extra woman. So from the 26, 26 more women were recruited and each one of them got a water tank. After that, money remained and these particular women, 26 women, looked for land and bought a plot which was one hectare. On this particular plot, today stands their demonstration center and a training center. In this particular plot, women practice their farming. Now, um, just to go back and be able to say that. Through partnership, even women who are donors are able to reach out to others who can help. So as women, let us not shy of using one another to help us even when we want to help or do good on the ground. Uh, once the women were able to buy their plot, it was very interesting because the women negotiated the price of the plot, the women looked for the plot themselves. This wasn't done by Soroptimist International. The women did it themselves. It showed that the women started taking care of their role as leaders or as owners of the project. And they forged ahead. Uh, I know today you want to hear how many water tanks were bought, uh, how many families were reached, but my story is a story that will not be expressed by pictures or by words. 
we have seen the women walk and grow. The women have learned um, to do agriculture on their plot. The, through the women, further um, projects were reached out where the women entered into food security, as you can see from the pictures. And in the second phase of this particular project of food security, the women decided our extra money that is remaining, we would like to complete our project of piping the water through the whole village. So we see through these Muihoko women that, that women get water tanks for themselves. They got water tanks for other women. But it didn't stop there. Because somebody else came and dug a borehole, the women decided we are going to pipe the water from the borehole to be able to reach the homesteads in this particular village, which today over 320 homesteads are able to access uh, the water piping, mainly because of the women and because of their governance in the project. The women were taught how to write their own um, constitution. The women did their own elections. The women opened their bank accounts which is being managed by them. And today, if you went, I visited there uh, a week ago, uh, their bank is still functional. Though of course, um, they have to access the bank, which is, uh, which is over 50 kilometers from them. So sometimes it becomes hard. The women can stand up today and look at the eye and explain their problems and explain their, their progress Today, most of these women you see in these pictures are part of the committees, water committee in the village. Um, they are sought up uh, also as um, village elders, let us call it village elders, in various other issues about education, um, about other development issues, about health in their community, because for some reason, because of this water project, the community, the community realized that women can actually be a powerful tool. And men have come across and supported these women. The chief, who is a man, has come and supported this particular project. Uh, the people in the county government have come to support these particular uh, women. So water was used as an object that brought the women together. It was a challenge in the beginning, but it, is, it has been the, the catalyst for development in this particular village. Uh, we have noticed that uh, governance is a very, very important thing. Uh, if you don't know how to rule yourself, if you don't keep to the narrow, a lot of projects flop. And it's just because of that little small reason that most projects don't work. We realize that uh, women in themselves can also be used as catalyst. These women wrote a second proposal. In the second proposal, what they did with the water tank was able to be replicated to other women in seven other counties in Kenya. And so, because it worked in their particular community, it had been piloted in their community and it worked. That is how this particular project was replicated in um, other, other areas. I would also like to say that um, in one all minute, this, Rose. one minute. That's okay. The women contributed not only labor and ideas, the women also contributed their money. And since they contributed their money, it helped them in the ownership of the project. And if you come till today, most of the women still have their water tanks. Most of the women have the piping to their places. They have their taps. They take care of the piping system in the whole of the village. That is their responsibility. And they still continue with their project because they set their, their ground right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rose. This is a 
brilliant project and really, really uh, underline the empowerment of women and how much it can grow from a little seed to a big, big uh, project with so many involved. So congratulations, it's really, really a great project. And it's wonderful that you have been here, uh, been uh, visited, them, visited them so recently um, and, and you follow up on the project. That, that is uh, really fantastic. Well, I hope that the participants have been inspired by the speakers as much as I have. Thank you for making this an outstanding event. I would like to thank each one of you for the valuable, enlightening, inspiring, and clever contribution of each topic shared with us. The topic for this event, Women, Water, and Climate Change, Roles and Risks, Tackling the Challenges, have been addressed with experience and expert expertise, highlighting and showing us the importance of enabling and empowering women to contribute to effective climate action under different circumstances. The importance of integrating gender responsive approaches to climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction, implementation of policies and programs also at the grassroots level, the mental health issues related to climate change, women and water and the UN, and of the importance of tackling the possibilities and barriers for the use resilience in connection to climate change. So before I finish up, I would like to ask Maureen and Marit if they would like to say a few words. Yes, I would. Um, I would like just to, on behalf of SI, thank the Women for Water Partnership for joining with us this evening in this event. Sir Optimus recognized that women, gender equality and climate change are interrelated and interlinked. Women are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change than men, primarily because they constitute the majority of the world's poor and are more dependent for their livelihood on natural resources that are threatened by climate change. We go away tonight knowing the challenges of what needs to happen, but I know that Sir Optimus will rise to those challenges and they will play their part in the future. And I have to say, uh, not only do I want to thank all of the speakers because I find them inspiring. And I loved hearing about the projects and I loved hearing the history. Um, so um, I also wanted to thank Lee and Ulla for their work in putting this uh, together for us. And more importantly, for you who are here listening and uh, making this a success. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, Marie? Uh, I would thank uh, I would thank you all for the opportunity, Ulla. Thank you for organizing all this. This is really wonderful. It was a little bit uh, stressful here on this side because we are in Senegal and in, at the World Water Forum, but. Uh, uh, we have um, uh, really implemented uh, projects and, and, and uh, statements from SI as well, so uh, it's, uh, it's nice uh, to have been able to, uh, to see you here all. And, uh, and I can tell you it's really nice to actually meet people again, <laughs> three-dimensional. <laughs> we can even touch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Marit, and and please enjoy together with Rose uh, and Les, um, yeah, and Leslie the rest of the week. Um, so thank you so much uh, to the participants for supporting this event organized by Women for Water Partnership and SI, and I hope you find it fruitful. Stay safe and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.